Hello everyone, my name is T and I work for Komodo and today we're doing an interview with Laura Shigahara. We're also joined by Drifty, who's the founder of Driftwood Gaming. You may know him for his tutorials and Let's Plays on his channel. Hi, Drifty. Hello, hello. Now, uh, Laura Shigahara is known for her music and a wonderful game named Raccoon that she created. She also uh, has music in games that people are pretty familiar with, such as Planets vs. Zombies and To the Moon. Hi, Laura. Hi. How are you doing today? Pretty good. We would like to get to know you a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so you guys might know me uh, for my work in the game industry. I'm a video game developer and composer. I did the, as you mentioned, I uh, made the soundtrack for Plants vs. Zombies. I've also done audio on games like To the Moon, uh, CSGO, World of Warcraft, um, High School Story, Super Meat Boy for PS4 Vita, a um, bunch of different things. Wow. Um, I made a game called Rockwin, which um, we'll be talking about today. And I really love working on peripheral video game projects as well. Um, for example, I got to co-arrange, uh, write lyrics, and perform three of the songs on the official Square Enix Chrono Trigger Chrono Cross 20th anniversary album with Yasunori Mitsuda. Um, and I co-created the ending credits uh, song for the Minecraft documentary. So I do a lot of different kinds of video game projects. Um, I love it. <laughs> that's wow. awesome. Yeah, that sounds pretty incredible. Very it sounds nice. like a, a fun career to have. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that you have a passion for making music. What was it that made you want to create a video game? Um, I, I think I always wanted to ever since I was a kid. Um, I loved games like Mega Man and Chrono Trigger. And um, when, I, when I was a kid, I actually would just draw out like Mega Man levels and make different bosses and stuff like that. And wow. uh, but I think back then that was before um, indie games became bigger. So like most of the games were coming out of large companies, and it didn't you know seem like one person could create a game. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so when I got older, and there were things like RPG Maker and people um, in the in indie scene that were making their own games, um, whether they built the engine or whether they, they used game development software, I was like, oh, wow, maybe, maybe it's possible. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, kind of along the same lines then, how did you discover RPG Maker and what made you choose to use RPG Maker as your engine when you were making Requiem? So um, I think that I was reading a lot of stuff about um, how long it would take to kind of build a game from the ground up. And I do have a bit of a programming background. Um, I was a class or two short of a CS minor. Um, so I did take a lot of programming classes, but it's not my forte. And I figured that if I was to go that route, it would take me a lot longer. Um, and so with RPG Maker, it cut out a lot of that. So I could focus mm -hmm. more on telling the story. Um, and it also was flexible. Like I like that even though there was a lot of stuff built in, um, if you knew um, how to you know, code in Ruby and stuff like that, you could script and um, do a lot of things outside of the framework too. So I really liked that it was just a great tool to, um, I guess, facilitate uh, spending more time on, on the parts of the game that I wanted to, to work on. So yeah. Save time. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. It's such a charming engine, RPG Maker. Yeah. And as yeah. Underrated, you don't have to code, but like if you are a coder, you have a ton of flexibility to add all kinds of intricate systems upon uh, one another. And, it, and I think uh, we've seen the community put together lots of impressive things with the engine. Mm hmm. I like how people do a lot of different types of games too. I mean, like obviously JRPGs are going to be the the predominant <laughs> type of game but i've seen people make something as different as a shmup um on the engine um and like rock one isn't like a full-out or jrpg like there's no battles there's mm -hmm. no you know getting equipment and leveling up in that regard but it still was really convenient for things like uh, the types of puzzles that i wanted to build um and i could code and make you know simple state machines and stuff with it um and it was just really um convenient for the type of game I was trying to make. So I think that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. So um, what was your inspiration for Rakuen? Um, okay, so back in 2011, 
I got asked to contribute a song uh, for the Play for Japan album, which was the charity album that was being put together uh, by Akira Yamaoka, who's the Silent Hill composer. Um, so he got a bunch of different composers uh, from around the world. And the song I ended up submitting was called Jump. And that song at the time um, was kind of about how in life, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen next. You know, if we have a new job, new relationship, we move, you don't know if it's going to work out or not, but you just have to kind of hope for the best and move mm -hmm. forward. Um, and after writing that song, my friend Emmy and I were like, oh, let's make a music video, you know, like a little animated music video. <laughs> and um, so when I met up with her, um, she showed me a bunch of like concept art and I was like, oh, I was so inspired. I was like, this is so cool. We shouldn't just make a music video. We should make a game. <laughs> we actually worked together at EA. Um, for a while and she had left and um it was like oh you know this would be this would be a good time <laughs> to do this kind of thing so yeah we ended up going from there and um the music video actually the idea behind that was um pretty similar to the game um it was going to be like a boy in the hospital whose mom takes him on an adventure they climb out the window and go to this fantasy world and she's got to get him to this goal and um we ended up adapting that to the game. And I guess that's where it came from. And the kind of cool part about it is that that song, Jump, um, ended up being the ending credits song for Rock One. That's so. cool. Wow, that's an incredible origin story. So is it safe to assume <laughs> that she's responsible for the art of Rock One? Yes, she's the lead artist. She, so she did the uh, the lovely portrait art that you see throughout the game. Um, she also ended up doing a lot of like the the characters um, and some of the background art. So yeah, and, and the concept art as well. It's truly incredible. It's truly incredible. I love the art of that game. It's so cute. I was always so excited when she'd send me new art assets, <laughs> um, especially if I was like, like there's this one exchange we had where um, uh, in Monsieur Bud's mansion, it's this one section where you kind of go work as a, a waiter in this fancy place where you're serving tea to like flower creatures and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this one character that's kind of like a rebel and he's putting up graffiti around the mansion. And he basically drew like a picture of the, the guy who owns it, like his butt. And he's like, <laughs> he's pooing. <laughs> <laughs> just like, oh, that would be good graffiti. So I, I try to construct this, you know, formal email to her. I'm like, Emmy, do you think you could draw me a picture of this, you know, pink flower guy's butt with poo? You know, and she's like, I'm on it. Wow. <laughs> and you she know, sent it back. <laughs> I'm surprised that I don't remember that. I definitely played that part. I, I'm, I, I'm tempted now to go back and, and see that. <laughs> That's really funny. So in the game, do you have any personal connection with the characters? Definitely. Yeah. Like, obviously, the personal stuff was altered, you know, for privacy reasons and everything. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. the game um, is hugely inspired by um, different um, members of my family and different personal experiences and stuff like that. So it's a very personal game to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's probably common. I know I do that when I'm trying to develop a game. I can't help it. You know, you, you draw from your experiences mm -hmm. in life. So it's probably something a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah. I feel like the best like stories and movies and things like that are when people put a, a part of themselves into it because it's more sincere and genuine. And yeah, um, my family, I'm half Japanese. And so everyone on my dad's side of the family is from Japan and specifically um, the Shigihara family comes from Sendai, um, which is where the tsunami and earthquake happened back in 2011. And so um, it was really important to me to kind of... Uh, show a lot of like slice of life things that um happened around that time and kind of tie everything together mm -hmm. and um it, it was kind of a neat experience you know i talked to a lot of my relatives in in the development process you know to get input you know i spent a lot of time uh, just kind of researching things and uh, reflecting and um so i'm very excited for them to be able to play it too like my mom's side of the family mm -hmm. <laughs> could experience it now but for the people that only speak japanese i'm excited for them to be able to play um a japanese version eventually. oh that's fabulous that's fabulous i did notice that mm -hmm. you um well, what you did for me was help me to see a bit of japan's history in a completely different light and in, in a way that i hadn't you know thought about or it hadn't occurred to me before mm hmm 
Oh, that's awesome. It was very well done. So um, when you're making the game, what aspects of game design do you enjoy the most? Hmm. That's like a tough question because like I have some friends that differentiate between like story writing and game design. Um, but when you're making a story game, they kind of like intersect a lot. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me, I really like um, doing different things with the game mechanics, the storytelling, the audio, like how it all goes together to try to like move people or make them feel things, you know, whether that's feeling you know, kind of a catharsis during a, a bittersweet scene or whether they're kind of unsettled. Um, a lot of people in my community like to joke that Rakuen is in the, should be in the genre of wholesome horror. <laughs> 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 because they, a lot of people don't realize there's actually some kind of unsettling sections, you know, like yeah. um, there's no like jump scares or anything like that, but there's definitely some places that will make you feel kind of unsettled. Um, it's very real really, at times. Yeah, yeah. I really love crafting those kinds of scenes, you know, like things like the background ambience. And um, it was fun using RPG Maker to create like dynamic audio, so little things like, you know, randomly triggered noises or footsteps, um, things like there might be like a body there and then you come back and it's gone just like little things that make the player feel unsettled mm -hmm. even um like with puzzle games i found it's really difficult to design puzzles that everybody is on the same wavelength about because there's like you know people that are gonna get something really quickly and then people um might take a really long time to figure it out. Maybe not even because it's difficult for them, but maybe they'll sneeze during a critical clue. Um, and so I was like, how do I um, adjust to that so that, you know, to get the best outcome so that people won't just be like, oh, that's so easy and there's no challenge, but to accommodate for people that might not get it right away. So it was really fun kind of flavorfully trying to do that. Like one example, um, there's like an anagram um, sentence you have to figure out. And at first it was just on paper scattered throughout the section, but that too few people would figure it out in any kind of reasonable amount of time. So I did something where I ended up writing the scrambled words on the wall in this kind of creepy red print. It helped people out without making it seem handholdy. Um, and two, it was actually really flavorful because it was so freaky to suddenly see these creepy words written on the wall. <laughs> Because I have a lot of wall writing in the game. Um, so just like dynamic things like that, I found really fun. Um, also just like telling the story in both a linear and nonlinear way. Because um, with a movie, everything is it's super linear. You're just like watching it all the way through. But with games, you know, cutscenes are linear. But there's so much more you can learn about the characters in the world through doing non-mandatory things, you know, like interacting with certain objects or um you know digging deeper into dialogue trees when you talk to npcs um and so coming up with a way to disseminate that information both through the things that people have to play versus the things that they can choose to play um that that was a fun kind of game design balance too like a story game design balance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's definitely evident in your game that you enjoy those things because they're they're done well and they're throughout the entire game Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so um, uh, kind of on the opposite side of things, the flip side, what would you say was your biggest challenge in developing Rakuen and how did you overcome it? Ooh, for that, I would probably say that since, well, it was a pretty lengthy project. Like I spent about four years on it, um, mainly because I didn't like the last half of the game I was working full time, but the first half I was still doing a lot of other contract work for other things. Um, but I think a big challenge was when you hit like a creative block and you don't really know how it pans out, like how to get around that. So for example, like I got the first couple arcs of the game figured out and felt pretty solid. I was really happy with the way the game started, but arcs three and four, um, when I played through them, they weren't very impactful, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, how do I, <laughs> how do I get that to work? Um, and so I ended up spending like a lot of time just figuring out how to make those more meaningful to the player, which actually ended up requiring a complete overhaul mm. um, of something. Um, and 
seeding things throughout the game and making sure each of those things that I was retroactively adding didn't break anything else. Um, and I think, yeah, just like sometimes I would feel like this is impossible. How am I going to connect this? Like, cause you're looking at so many things all at mm -hmm. once, you know? Um, and yeah, anytime, if, if people have made games, you know, then they're like, yeah, it's a lot to balance. Um, so kind of going back and sorting through that in order to get past a creative block, I think was the biggest challenge. Um, for me getting around that, um, I think one of the best strategies was to just get really inspired about it again. And then I figured my brain would solve it eventually. So I would do stuff like, um, go sit at the piano and play the music for the final scene. Cause I had the, the final scene in my head before I even started the game. So I would play it. I would imagine what the characters were saying to each other. Um, and I'd play the ending credits song. Um, and that would usually, um, inspire me or mm -hmm. get me back to the, the core of it, I guess you could say, but yeah, definitely overcoming creative blocks, staying on task. Um, I think you need a lot of grit <laughs> to get through a, game, a lengthy mm. game. So yeah. Absolutely. Um, I know music is like a major source of inspiration for a lot of people. I love going through mm. like the types of music that are available because I'm, I'm not a musician. So I have to like find generous contributions from other people or buy, <laughs> buy music. But <laughs> when I'm going through, like you can just imagine the scenes that these music pieces are playing in and like the characters that are a part of the scene. And it's just such a great tool for, for finding inspiration. So, um, in your journey of game creation and game development, uh, have you been inspired or impressed by the work of other indie devs on the scene? Yeah, definitely. This is actually a hard question for me because <laughs> I was like, oh, there's so, <laughs> there's so many, you know, good indie games out there. And so I was trying to think, like, how do I narrow it down? Um, specifically in the RPG Maker community, I really liked um, one of my favorite independent games is called Florette Blanc, and it's made by um, Merlin Dees. Um, and I just uh, think it's so neat how he's made so many different games. And a lot of them, he just kind of throws them out there, you know, like he makes them out of a passion for making them. And um, like Florette Blanc was such a fun game. I remember it had been a while since I played a game where I was like excited to get back home to play it. <laughs> but with that game, I was like, I wanted to know what happened in the story so badly. And it was such an interesting game too, because like there's kind of a learning curve with the, it's got this fencing um, battle system. It's sort of different from what I've experienced. And um, like, it took me a bit to get into it, but once I was, like, into the story, I was super hooked. Um, and the music was really good. It really matched everything that was going on. Um, so that that was kind of inspiring. Um, there's Zariab. Maybe you guys have seen his name around. Um, he's been making, like, RPG Maker scripts and helping folks out for, like, years and years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and yeah. He's on our Discord server. Yeah. He likes to hang out every now and then. He taught me how to use the console for developing. Very um, talented developing. programmer, yeah, it's too. very good. Yeah. Awesome. So, so exa exactly, that's it. <laughs> you guys know why <laughs> I would mention him because he, he's so helpful and you can tell he just has a love for all of this stuff. Um, he's helped so many people who use RPG Maker bring their games to Steam, like to, to do Steam integration and stuff like that. And he's actually making his own game now, um, Desecrators, which is not an RPG Maker game. It's like um, kind of inspired by Descent. Um, and uh, I, I just think that's really cool that he's working on his own project now because he's helped so many of us in so mm -hmm. many ways. Um, I I really, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people mention this, but I really like Toby Fox's work as well. Mm -hmm. um, working with him on, I got to do the sing and arrange the ending theme for Deltarune. Um, and like, I'm always, when I played Undertale, I remember thinking that I didn't want to play it at first because I I swing between like with media getting inspired but also feeling discouraged. Mm. Like there's certain things where I feel like, oh, if this game is so good, I'm gonna compare and be like, oh, my game will never be <laughs> that polished or that, you know, whatever. I think right? we all fall so into that we... trap every now and then. Yeah, yeah. It's a delicate balance, like 
playing or experiencing things to get inspired versus discouraged. And so at first I wasn't going to play it until I was done. But um, at some point I was like, you know what, I'll just, I'll just play it. So I kind of played it after everybody else did. Um, and it actually inspired me. Like I was very, you know, blown away by how I thought everything was just so perfect. Like it, it just fell into place. Everything felt like it felt like nothing was an afterthought, if that makes sense. Like everything felt so deliberate and it was entertaining, really good music. Um, and <laughs> strangely, the thing that I took away from it um, was like the relationship between the, the protagonist and Toriel, like she was very affectionate, you know, mm -hmm. and she'd say a lot of very affectionate things. And for some reason, I felt like I was holding back um, in my game with the relationship between boy and mom, mm. where it was almost like I was afraid to um, be too real about their relationship. But I mean, a mom and like a seven or eight year old boy, like the kid is still young enough that they are going to be very, um, you know, like it, it certainly wouldn't be the same as like a mom and a 20 year old, right? Mm -hmm. So it kind of told me it's okay to be a little mushy, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so I felt like that kind of unlocked that. And I, I was able to tell a more realistic depiction uh, between a mom and a young young son um, in that regard. But yeah, but definitely uh, his work inspires me a lot too. But I don't even, like there's so many people. It's, How much time it's do you got? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's so many creative minds out there. You can't just name, uh, you know, you can't pick one that was the most. It's, there's just a plethora of creative people. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. So for all these other game devs out there who hope to have a, a commercial game someday or release a full full length game like Raccoon, what kind of advice would you give them? Hmm. I think like one of the biggest things is just to know when you're getting into it that it is even if it's a, a short game, like it's going to be a lot of work. And um so before like throwing everything into it. Cause I'll see some people who will be like, I have this idea. Okay. I'm going to get all these art assets and music and stuff like that before there's ever like proof of concept. Um, and then they'll end up scrapping the project and like they'll have wasted a lot of time and energy or money, you know, getting assets mm -hmm. together. And so I feel like a really good thing is if you don't have all those assets already, um, it's totally okay to use template stuff at first, you know, um, RTP, stuff like that, just till you get the basic idea across and then you can replace it later on. I think that saves a lot of time in the end because I can't tell you how many projects I've seen where all the assets get, you know, a lot of the assets get created up front and the project never happens. Mm. So that's like a big part of it. Like, be okay with using template <laughs> step placeholder stuff, you know, until you know this is the project that you want to devote time to. Um, another thing, and this also relates to people kind of jumping around a lot. Like I know so many like super creative, talented people that have never finished a game because they'll get partway into it and then they'll either get stuck on something or they'll just get bored of it and then they'll jump to another project. So they mm -hmm. have all these like, you know, projects that are like 20% finished. And so I, I also am like, what do you call it? Weak to that, <laughs> prone to that. <laughs> I think for creative folks, you know, when you get a lot of ideas, it's very exciting to get a new mm -hmm. idea. And so the way I kind of got around that was I said, okay, Laura, like if you come up with an idea, you get to have one day where you can take a break from Rockwin and you can like do whatever you want, you know, like write out the story, sketch out characters, prototype it if you know, like <laughs> set up a, a file, you know, to get get it started, do whatever you want. And um, that was actually really helpful because mm. I usually will get burnt out pretty early on, um, you know, I'll sit there with a notepad and I'll just like write and write and write and draw. And then after a while, I'll realize, hmm, as much as I like this idea, I'm going to hit the same, you know, issues as I would with what I'm working on now. So, okay, it's okay to shelf that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but ba basically, it's like I, I allowed myself time to kind of expand on those ideas, but I cut myself off so that I wouldn't get distracted. Um, so yeah, I think that's another big thing. So using placeholder assets and giving yourself time to explore new ideas, but cut yourself off so that you don't get 
distracted, like finishing a game a lot of times, like even when you think, I don't know how I'm going to pull this together. If you love it enough and you like remember like what I was saying earlier about like coming back to the music or coming back to, um, you know, what inspired the original idea? Was it like a conversation you had between a friend? Was it a movie you watched? Like a nature hike <laughs> somewhere? Basically like figure out how to get back to the source again so mm -hmm. that you get inspired. And I, I really do believe the brain kind of like that you, you kind of work it out <laughs> eventually, but you got to stick with it. So that, that would be my biggest advice. That's good advice. Stick with yeah. it and be persistent and give yourself a break when you need a break. But um, don't mm -hmm. get too distracted off of mm -hmm. new ideas because you'll hit the same pitfalls. I think it's interesting yeah. that you mentioned proof of concept, too, because I know a lot of really fabulous full full feature games out there started as a game jam game and just something yeah. whipped up really quickly in 30 days or in two weeks um, with terrible assets. But the, the idea fit. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's so true. Like all of the. Um, people in like game design circles i mean like say the same thing like with plants vs zombies for example that started off as like napkin art and like simple proof of concept and even before it had all the you know final polished art in there it was really fun to play like with whatever art was included so mm -hmm. then it's like okay that's you know that's a good base okay now let's get the assets in so then you end up saving time because art takes a lot of time music takes a lot of time it does um, yeah. I mean, I would dare say that it's probably the most time-consuming part of creating a game is the art and the music. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I would say the music is the most fun part because I get lost. The whole day will just be a big blur when I'm making a soundtrack to, um, you know, to, when I'm making one of the the songs to a game. Uh, and making art is, like, so hard for me, but uh, I love making the music. <laughs> I, I like had to do a lot of the pixel art myself um, at the end because we just had so many assets that we needed to replace before our release deadline. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying like that <laughs> even if I can figure out how to do it, it probably takes me like 10 times as long as Emmy, oh, <laughs> you know, you or know. like other artists where it's their forte. <laughs> I can sprite if I try really, really hard, but I hate it. <laughs> How was that experience for you? Did did you did you enjoy it, or was it just you know a difficult one of the obstacles that you wound up facing? Yeah. Um. Well, one of the okay, there was two things I liked about it, and one of them was that it gave me a break from the more cerebral stuff because when you're like coding, um, you have to really concentrate and mm -hmm. focus you know yeah. like um but with pixel art a lot of times especially if i was using a palette that like um already was established from concept art or something i didn't have to you know like do math <laughs> or anything like that you know it was just kind of relaxing to do so even if it took me a really long time it kind of gave me a break from the more cerebral elements um the other thing i liked about it was that my artist friends always talk about how um they can listen to music or watch tv while they're doing their job mm -hmm. And as a composer, I absolutely can't do either of those things nope. when I'm doing my job. <laughs> you can't listen to music when you're composing music. Absolutely. So not. that was, <laughs> yeah. So I would have like, you know, Yoshi's Woolly World soundtrack or the Destiny soundtrack or something, you know, in the background playing. And I was like, wow, so this is, this is what it's like to get to listen to music <laughs> while working. <laughs> you know, that's a good so. point. <laughs> <laughs> So um, when, when it did come to time to release Requiem and you had to market it, what kind of tools did you use and what avenues did you use to get the name out there? Oh, okay. So that's that was like challenging because at first I thought that's the part I would love the most because I love talking to people. I'm fairly extroverted, you know. I like also talking online and um and just goofing around and like I couldn't wait to I was like oh when I start doing interviews I can you know talk about the story I'm so excited <laughs> but towards the end of development it's almost like I became more introverted from like coding and from doing things where I was so in my head mm -hmm. for so long well, I was like kind of more isolated during that time because I was working a lot like I would wake up at like eight in the morning and work all day <laughs> until like I'd go to bed around like midnight or one mm -hmm. um, and only stop to like eat, to go on a walk, you know, <laughs> to go to the bathroom. 
<laughs> so I, it's hard for me to imagine that now because like it was such an unhealthy schedule. And I think I became very like in my head. And so when it, the game did come out and it came time to talk to people, I found it actually far more difficult than at the beginning of the game because mm. I was so tired. But like for, for marketing, I had kind of like um, built up an audience over the years um, from other projects that I'd worked on. Um, like whenever people would write articles about things like Plants vs. Zombies, I'd usually reach out, you know, and say, thank you for writing the article. So I tried to keep um, <clears throat> like good relations with people mm -hmm. um, and interact with folks, you know, go to different events like at GDC and indie game events and things so that um, the channel, you know, I would be able to talk about it if I needed to. Um, I, let's see, <laughs> what else did I do? Because there's a lot of stuff I do nowadays that I, I didn't do back then. Um, but... Uh, I also had a YouTube channel um, that was totally for fun. Like I didn't use it for work. I used it to post like original music or um, like video game stuff that I liked. And so that channel actually grew a fair amount. And so um, there was a lot of like organic, I guess, community stuff where I could reach out to people through mailing lists and through YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. um, one of the fun things that... I ended up doing for marketing that I liked because I've always been into like co musical collaborations with some of my friends on YouTube um, were so awesome. They did uh, songs from Rock One, like uh, one of my friends, G. Brittany, she played this beautiful violin um, version of one of the tracks and a string player gamer. He did uh, a strings version of the music that plays when you're in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, Ferd K did this cool metal version of the Spirit Envoy. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot of like uh, musical collaborations that happened. And um, that kind of marketing I find the most fun because <laughs> it's like the kind of thing I would want to do anyway, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it was a lot of, a lot of different stuff, a mix of um, posting, you know, on YouTube or social media, a mix of collaborations, a mix of um, sending out to uh, journalists and people that had written about my work prior. A lot of people either talked about projects I worked on or there's actually people who wrote about stuff when I'd post it on YouTube, when I post music on YouTube as well. So I would just reach out to all those people because um, it was easier. Like I don't, I really don't like reaching out to people if I don't feel that they would want to write about my work or if I don't think that they would be interested in it because it feels so imposing. If I know the person follows my work and is, you know, would like it anyway, it feels more natural. Nowadays though, if I were to release a game, like I'm a lot more um, active in community things. Like I have a very active Twitch channel. Um, I'm a, a brand ambassador for Twitch now. So I would probably share a lot um, with the community and do a lot of activities uh, related to that. Um, but yeah, back then it was really tough because I was like trying to remember my extroverted side. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> what do I do? I was so tired. But um, but yeah, it was it was kind of fun and challenging at the same time. That's interesting. Really good advice. I appreciate you sharing that. So you you did mention <laughs> um, next time. So I have to ask: Do you have any plans <laughs> to develop another game using RPG Maker or you know anything in the future? I do. It's it's very difficult because like I have so much on my plate right now. I'm doing so many things. Yeah. But I actually do have like a few game ideas that I want to work on. Um, one that would use RPG Maker and one that wouldn't. Um, and so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I just have to find the time for it. Um, but I definitely want to continue uh, developing games. It's such a unique way of connecting with people. Um, and it's just, I don't know, it's neat. I love watching people play the game. Um, it's one of my favorite things to go and see folks play like the last third of the game. Because I would say that like everything comes together in the last third. Um, and so it's such an experience. And I feel like I've actually made friends with people or gotten to know them better just from watching them watch or play the last third of the game. Because <laughs> they end up like sharing stories about uh, their own personal experiences and so it mm -hmm. sort of feels like getting to know them and a lot of times if this is on twitch they'll come to my channel um afterwards and like or i'll go watch their streams and um so it's kind of neat i love that aspect of like how games can bring people together it's always so, so exciting yeah. to watch somebody play a uh, play a game that you created or, mm -hmm. or experience something you've crafted 
Uh, I, mm-hmm. I loved the same. I remember when I released uh, Legend of Driftwood uh, several years ago, I had somebody who was adamant on speed running the game. And so he would play it <laughs> oh, over yeah. and over and over, trying to beat it faster and faster. Yeah. And I was so excited Drifty to watch would have him to watch every, it time. every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, wait, 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 wait. He's going to do a stream. Hold on, everybody. Quiet. <laughs> 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 that's so cool it's very satisfying yeah like just knowing people know something you created so well that they're able to speed run it like that is so cool <laughs> <laughs> i remember too like um during one of my streams like a few of my mods um for my birthday made a game for me called mega shiggy because <laughs> i really like mega man um <laughs> and it's so silly it's it's actually like a very good fun game but yeah, they, they made it free so anyone can play it. And um, it was great because uh, they included a lot of like inside jokes from the stream. And they actually secretly got Emmy to make the portrait art for it. And one of our other friends who does freestyle rap, they made him like the villain. <laughs> and so there's this whole section where he's like aggressively like rapping <laughs> at me, like threats and insults. And it's just, it, it was so silly, but it also had like a really good message. And I did play it on stream and I had a pretty strong emotional reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking like, oh yeah, this is, um, I I didn't, I wanted them to be able to see my reaction because I was like, I love watching people's reactions when they play my game. Mm -hmm. Um, But I joked that I'm glad that the first time I played it, I didn't do it on stream because I was such a mess. (laughs) I I got to this one part that was like bawling. (laughs) Um, uh, Good game then. yeah. Yeah. I totally had sand in my eyes when I finished playing Rakuen. It was a, uh, <laughs> it definitely created an, an emotional reaction, especially since, you know, I'm, I don't want to spoil anything, but I'm just going to say I'm a mother. And so it definitely gave oh. me a, an emotional reaction. Yeah. Oh, thank you for telling me that. I love when moms play um, <laughs> the game. Like I've seen a few moms play and it always hits harder. <laughs> When I watch moms play the game. Yeah, I think it so, probably hits moms you. a little harder. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you for telling me that. That's awesome. <laughs> it's, it's such a skill you know, my... to be able to get somebody to feel something, to have an emotional connection to a game. And I think that really just makes it that much more special. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm smiling so big right now. <laughs> Yeah, you know what's funny? My mom um, was probably one of my best beta testers um, because she's so brutally honest sometimes that like I know if she likes or doesn't like something, then I'll know it. Um, So one of the first iterations at the beginning of the game, she like literally fell asleep (laughs) in the first hour. It was like, oh no. And she was like, oh, I'm sorry. I just didn't get much sleep last night. And I'm like, no, no, this is this is good feedback. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is valuable. I like, yeah, I totally changed it around. And then I had her play it again and she didn't fall asleep the second time. She was very engaged. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> Pacing is pretty critical in game development. You have to, you have, to have a good yeah. pace throughout the whole game. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's funny yeah. uh, having a pride point being that your game makes people cry. <laughs> I can I can relate to that actually because um, the way that I met Drifty was by making a game for the 2017 IGMC, and it tended to make people cry. It totally made Drifty cry, even if he won't admit it. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, he'll admit it. Uh, yeah, it was. I had something in both of my eyes. Okay. <laughs> And I, I couldn't believe how I, proud I was that I was making people cry. I felt kind of like a sadist. I was going to say, that's kind of a sadist <laughs> move there. Especially taken out of context. I was so proud I made people cry. <laughs> but no, you're totally right. Like, that's, it's so true. Because it means that you, like, got through to someone's heart. And so yeah. it's really, yeah. I want to play your game. I like crying. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know when I release it in the third quarter of 2050. <laughs> no. <laughs> Probably 2023. Yeah, it's actually um, very, it's it's very close to a finishable state, but I um, I have a little problem. Of restarting over and over and over. I do. I, I, I knock it down to the ground, and I build it from the ground up We've again. We've invested I've done a lot of three time times. and money yeah. and stuff. And- mm mm-hmm. It'll happen eventually. <laughs> <laughs> if I could, you know, be satisfied with it someday. 
That I I can definitely relate to that because I restarted Rockwind three times before I got it right. <laughs> hey. I, I I wanted to change like at first Rockwind was gonna be a crafting game and I had set it up so the Liebel village was like each hut was like a different crafting station. Um but it just wasn't working out, so I was like, oh, okay. And I couldn't just like read, like change things around. I had I had to start completely over mm-hmm. again. Um, so then I made it a JRPG. But then I was like, it just doesn't make sense that you're fighting kobolds in a hospital. Like I don't know, it just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So then I I knocked it to the ground again, as you said, and started over again with it being more of a point and click game. And then it finally fit. And it was like, oh, this is actually perfect for the the narrative and for disseminating information. So definitely can relate to that. (laughs) Yeah, I can't speak for your first two versions, but I'd say you probably made a good move because the final one is just it it feels perfect. It's well done. Oh, thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) So do you have any exciting news coming up or developments that you'd like to share with us? Um, well, let's see. If you guys like the characters from Rockwind, we are actually finally doing a second run of merchandise. Mm-hmm. Um, there, I, I'm pretty excited about this because when I was a kid, I loved Sanrio stuff or San X stuff. You know, like the Hello Kitty line yeah. of things. Yeah. I had like stickers and so um, <laughs> I wanted to have like stuff like, you know, stickers and notebooks and pins and things that were kind of in that style, you know, using the types of characters um, from the game and from the stream that I do. And so I'll, I'll just say one of the things we're working on. There's like a sticker set that's like characters from Rockwood, mm-hmm. um, like, you know, Lil Buds and the Liebels and Mini Mori and those kind of characters um, mixed with like Japanese slash Western foods and desserts. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> I just really love that kind of stuff. I collect like miniature fake foods and I have a lot of like stickers with those kinds of themes. So um, we will have merchandise coming up soon, probably um, I would say within the next couple months. Um, Besides that, there are some big projects um, on the horizon, but I haven't uh, really like put a release date on them yet. So I guess the biggest thing I would say is that if you liked uh, the music from Rockwind and if you just like video game music in general or, you know, Plants vs. Zombies stuff or Deltarune or any of those kinds of things, I do play a lot of that music live um, on my stream. It's just super shiggy (laughs) is Mm -hmm. is my Twitch channel. Um, And we have like a really interactive community too. I really love our community. Everyone knows each other and says hi and is very, very welcoming to new folks. Um, And yeah, it's like such a fun intersection of community and video games and music. Um, So yeah, I hope to see you there (laughs) if you want to come by. That's awesome. Thank you for letting us know. That sounds really interesting. And um, I'm sure the merchandise is just going to be absolutely adorable because your characters are just absolutely adorable. Oh, thank you. And I'll make sure to tell Emmy that too, because a lot of the characters she came up with. So yeah, thank you. So uh, we want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come and talk to us and let us get to know you a little better. Thank you so much for letting us in on your life and your creative process. And um, uh, it's very nice to meet you and to, to see and hear the person behind so many great works and just thank you thank you both for inviting me to do this it was really fun uh to talk about these things it's always an honor to get to talk about stories and music <laughs> that i've gotten to work on so, and you're, you're both so fun to talk to uh so i i had a great time <laughs>